Hi, Hi everybody. Welcome to today's um, discussion on distilling leadership, practical lessons for community leaders. As Duncan mentioned, my name is Liz Weaver and I'm the president and co-CEO of the Tamarack Learning Center and the Tamarack Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest uh, today, Jay Robb. Jay has, is in his 20th year of reviewing business books for the Hamilton Spectator, a local newspaper in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. He's reviewed more than 500 business books with a focus on leadership, teams, and organizational culture. By day, Jay serves as communications manager for McMaster University's Faculty of Science. He previously worked in public relations at Mohawk College, ArcelorMittal de Pasco, and Hamilton Health Sciences. Jay, Jay graduated from the University of Western Ontario with a Master's of Arts in Journalism. And I could think of no better person to invite um, to join us on this webinar to talk about distilling leadership because you've read so many you know, leadership books, Jay, over the last number of years. So why don't we begin um, first, Jay, by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work both at Mohawk College and at McMaster University. Sure. So thanks for having me, Liz. Um, and we've known each other, for, I think, for almost 20 years as well. So for as long as I've been reviewing business books, I think we've known each other. Uh, my work at Mac, as you said in the introduction, I'm the uh, manager of comms here in the Faculty of Science. And I'm closing in on my first anniversary. I think I've passed my probationary period, which is great. And uh, so I get to sing the praises of all our students and our faculty and staff. So I may have perhaps the best job here in the Faculty of Science. And I had a similar role before that at uh, Mohawk College. So I was there for 13 years. And then after 13 years, it was time to uh, graduate and go on to university. So that's sort of been, uh, you know, spent the last 14 years in post-secondary. You know, um, Jay, they talk about post-secondary institutions as being kind of anchor institutions uh, in communities. And you have a breadth of experience, right, at Mohawk, um, Mohawk College, at McMaster University, and even at Hamilton Health Sciences. And so what, uh, and we, we know that those institutions uh, invest deeply in building community leadership, whether it's through student leadership, through faculty leadership, or even through staff leadership in the community. So what has your experience um, really taught you about the role of anchor institutions in, uh, in building community leadership? Yeah, so I've been really, really lucky in that, whether it's been Tefasco or Mohawk or now McMaster, like these are anchor institutions that genuinely care about the community and they are proud to be part of Hamilton. And so at all three, I've seen sort of behind the scenes as to how they connect and engage with the community. So at DeFasco, for example, I remember uh, talking with John Mayberry, who was the CEO at the time. There was an employee who had to go to Buffalo because they couldn't wait as long as it was required to get an MRI. So John heard this story. And then I think within six months, DeFasco had purchased an MRI and put it in the Hamilton General. So that's sort of an example of how DeFasco has, and now ArcelorMittal DeFasco has stepped up again and again and again for the community. And there was a real expectation when you joined the company. I remember first day orientation, you go to HR and you sign the forms and there was this expectation that you were gonna to contribute to a fund that would help support all these initiatives in the community. It wasn't a question of would you, it was a question of like how much would you and like the leadership really set the tone and there was an expectation that everyone would do that. And then at Mohawk, I was really fortunate to have seen the, they have an access strategy that looks at how do we remove barriers to post-sec in sort of priority neighborhoods. And so I was able to see that from the ground up, sort of a day one and see how that evolved. And now here I'm at, at McMaster, they also have an access strategy that's in development. And I actually met last week with a colleague from the Office of Community Engagement here at MAC. So like, I've been, I'm one of the really, really lucky people in that I've been able to work uh, in organizations where I, I live. And I've worked for organizations that care about the community where I also happen to be raising my kids. So uh, like I said, really, really lucky guy. Yeah, those are, those are three really great examples in terms of how um, these kind of core institutions, whether it's a business um, or an anchor institution, how they really 
invest in and contribute to community leadership. And if you think about it, they're huge, right? They have a huge number of employees. And if we can, you know, in our communities, leverage that potential, I think oh, yeah. that, yeah, that- Yeah, I mean, they are among the largest employers in Hamilton in the region. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. It's something that we're particularly interested in um, from Tamarack's perspective, right? Because we find um, sometimes, and this isn't a question that we have, but I'll just go off script a little bit, sure. but we find sometimes it's a bit more challenging to engage um, uh, with, let's say, a Mohawk College or a Mac, uh, McMaster University because we don't know the entry points, right? We're not really sure you know, where to connect. And so um, maybe just if you had a little bit of advice around that. Yeah, sure. So let's start uh, with McMaster. So I mentioned the Office of Community Engagement. That would be, if you are a community partner, I would start there. And they are the front door for the community looking to get engaged with faculty and students. And they, um, uh, they work at both ends. So uh, for example, they met with me and they gave me a crash course in what's the difference between community outreach and community engagement. I always thought they were one and the same, but they were very, very different. Um, so if you're looking to connect with Mac, I would definitely start with the Office of Community Engagement and they can connect you. Like, like you said, there are just so many faculty, so many students here who are keen to get involved and they can help find the right partnership that will work for everyone. Uh, at Mohawk, um, Jim Vanderveek can, can thank me later, uh, but he is probably the person you want to connect with. He was involved with the access strategy from day one, uh, going out into communities saying, you know, what is it that you need? What can we do to help you? So he would be, I would say, start with Jim and then he will direct you to uh, the right people at, at the college. Yeah. And we have listeners from across Canada and the U S and I think, um, <clears throat> equally so you might, uh, <coughs> Connect to the community engagement um, department at the college or university yes. <clears throat> that exists in your community. So that's another way of kind of going around it. And and really, I think you know one of the things that we've learned <clears throat> at McMaster, sorry, or at sorry <clears throat> at Tamarack. Easy for you to we, say. <clears throat> yeah, is that we um, also um, it, having that personal connection can be really a point in all of this. Yeah, it's like the, the one thing I found, uh, I, and again, I've been really lucky where I've worked. There have been some outstanding faculty who are really, really passionate about this. And a lot of it is sort of going above and beyond. They are doing this work off the side of their desk. They don't have to do it. I mean, they can just, you know, teach from a textbook and, and keep the learning in the classroom. But there are some faculty, um, a lot of faculty, who yeah. are looking for these opportunities to connect students out into the community. And um, if you can find them, that's fantastic. But like I said, start with your office of community engagement, whether it's a college, university, I think almost all have them now, and that's probably the best place to go. So our next question, Jay, is that <clears throat> we know that you write a regular column, which is published in the, uh, the Hamilton Spectator, where you review business books. Yeah. And this is kind of like a side gig for you. Um, what are some of the leadership trends that you're seeing in the books that you've reviewed perhaps in the past six months or the past year? Past year, yeah. So yeah, so it's been my side hustle for uh, a year now. And actually, I'd gone in to see the editor 20 years ago. I said, how about a column on public relations? And he said, uh, no, uh, there likely would not be enough topics or readers for that to work. Uh, and then he said, how about reading some of these books that are piled up behind me on my desk? And that's kind of how that happened. So it's it's been the one constant through, you know, I've worked at DeFasco, Hamilton Health Sciences, Mohawk, and now McMaster. Uh, the book reviews have sort of been the one constant to run through it. Um, and uh, the reviews are every other week. So what are some of the leadership trends? Storytelling, I think, remains at sort of the top of the list. There's always a book a week, it seems, around helping leaders and organizations tell stories. Um, I'd say mercifully, we're coming to an end, I think, of the, here's what we can learn from big tech. Like you, we should all run our organizations like Facebook, Amazon, and Google. I think that's quickly coming to an end, which is a good thing. Um, and if I had to look ahead, usually the business books tend to lag what's happening out in the rest of the world. And I think when you look at how divisive 
everything's become, how polarized, just how coarse things have become like on social media. I think we're going to start to see more books about um, kindness, respect, um, just leaders who aren't, leaders who will do the right thing. I think we're going to see more of that. Um, we're going to be looking to organizations to return us to maybe the values that we've forgotten about as we all stare at our phones and, and tweet at each other. That's, those are really interesting. I think, I think you're right about that. Do you think, um, I know that there's been a number of books written recently about purpose, right? This notion yes. of shared purpose or shared value or that kind of thing. And have you seen that as a trend and maybe talk just briefly about what you've seen in terms of these kind of purpose-driven organizations? Yeah, so I'm actually just reading one now. I think later on you'll ask for a list of, of books. It's it's uh, by Steve Farber. It's called Love is Just Damn Good Business. And it talks about if you're a leader, you have two choices. You can love the organization you're leading, the colleagues that you work with, the mission of your organization, and the people you serve. Or you can love your paycheck, the perks that come with the job and your next promotion that you're going to get by virtue of being in the job you're currently in. And, you know, as employees, we can all tell where our leaders loyalties lie. And I think when you work with a purpose driven leader who passionately believes about the work that the organization's doing and the difference that it's making, uh, it sets a tone through the whole organization. The same thing also happens though, when you know that the leader is just sort of mailing it in, and they're in a role that's really just a stepping stone for something else. And if they do community engagement, it's all just a PR exercise. Like, I think we can all see through that. And it's fairly disheartening when it happens. But like, I've been really, really fortunate to work with leaders and work in organizations where things like respect is a core value and getting, giving back to the community uh, and being proud of where you're from uh, have sort of been cornerstones in the places where I've worked. So that's been really, really helpful. So at Tamarack, um, we're particularly interested in this notion of collaborative leadership, or sometimes we call it community leadership as well, where individuals and leaders kind of come together and work collaboratively to drive change on a big community issue. And I know um, your history and my history intersect around the work of the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction. Yes. And that's an example of, you know, a bunch of community leaders coming together and really saying, look, we got to we got to do something about this. And we're seeing more and more of that movement happening in the environment as well. Um, the question that I have is, are there any books that you've read uh, recently that kind of tackle this notion of community or collaborative leadership? and community change and you know what what did those authors suggest and are they books that we should make sure we have on our bookshelf which i know we're going to come back at but i'm really around yeah. these uh collaborative leadership books so on that one you know what i kind of drew a blank and I, part of it i've read 500 books so they all tend to blend together but then when i went through my reviews like i honestly don't think i've read a, and reviewed a book on that topic so maybe there's an opportunity there for you and Tamarack to write something. I, and I think like a book that speaks to business leaders on how to engage with the community would be really helpful. A book on for colleges and universities on how to do the same uh, would, would be really, really helpful. And I, you know, I always thought that what happened in Hamilton with the poverty round table, that would have been a great book, like a good case study on how to do it. Lessons learned what worked really well. And I think a whole lot of things worked really, really well. And then what some of the challenges were. So when I look at, you know, the bookshelf behind me or the books that land in my inbox at, at home, like I, I honestly don't think this topic has been done justice as a business book. Although we need, like you, and, and we know from working on the poverty round table, you need all three sectors to step up to the table. Like it's not something that just, the nonprofit sector can solve, the public sector can solve, or the private sector. It's when you get all three together, it's sort of that one plus one plus one equals something far more than just three. But uh, if you want to write the book, I'll be happy to uh, <laughs> to read it and review it. 
I'll give you a five star review. There you go. There you go. I think it is interesting, right? That, that that's really interesting to me that uh, we don't have one that you could just put your hand on right away and say, "Oh, like here are some lessons learned." Yes. Or that and I would definitely, I would definitely read it because yeah. you know this is something I'm, uh, you know, professionally and personally interested in. I, I will um, just because I sort of whiffed on that question for you. Uh, <laughs> But when I met with my colleagues from the Office of Community Engagement, they outlined McMaster's uh, core principles of community engagement. I thought they were really useful. So if anyone were to write a book, you could build each chapter of that book around one of these principles. So very quickly, it just started. Uh, principle one was respectful relationships. We can't have community without relationships. These are the connections that build community. Any successful partnership must be built on trusting and respectful relationships guided by integrity. So that was the first. Second, I won't go through all of them in that same detail though. Second was uh, reciprocity. Um, entails working, respecting that all partners bring valuable knowledge, skills, experience, and resources to any partnership. Equity, which is looking at reducing barriers of participation as much as possible. Fourth principle would be continuity, that, there, that different communities work on different timelines and schedules. And that's definitely true in I would say a university or college that you know our faculty are working to deadlines that are different than what the community may be working towards and there are short and long-term implications of that fifth principle would be openness to learning um it's sort of a, a transfer of knowledge and maybe we can get into later talking about what we've learned through partnerships but this idea that we share with each other what we've learned and we build capacity among all the partners i think is key and then finally, the sixth principle was commitment to act. So we aspire to make a positive difference in our community by sharing and acting on our knowledge to contribute to a greater social good. So I was at a, a conference, I think it was in the spring in Winnipeg. There was an indigenous leader who was talking about how their community was tired of being treated like a zoo. And they would have folks come in with really good intentions but they weren't always invited. Their timelines were not the timelines of the community and they didn't share the knowledge. So they didn't transfer what they knew to the community and then they just left. And then in some cases there was no follow-up, which was a real eye-opening experience or, or just a lesson to be learned from, from these folks. Because I've always been on the other end where we sort of go into a community. So to hear from somebody from a community, this is the experience. This, sometimes it goes well, other times it feels like we're, we're in a zoo and you know, you're coming in to save the day and then you move on to the next priority and nothing has really changed for us. I think those um, principles are really interesting. And I wonder, Jay, if um, you'd be okay if we shared them with everybody um, yes. in a post email. We send a post email after the call. And I think, you know, those uh, folks that are on the call listening to us, I'm sure that they would love to see the principles written down and then um, oh, figure out. Yeah, how might they apply to the work that I'm doing, you know, collaboratively or with other community leaders? How yeah. can I... Uh, maybe we at Tamarack we use the term R and D, but we think about it as rip off and duplicate. So how right. might we be able to, you know, paraphrase these in a way that works for my organization or the collaborative that I'm working for? Yeah, these six principles would have been so very very handy. Like when I looked at when I started, with all the best intentions, but and I remember going into a community and it was sort of like here we are to save the day. We're going to break the cycle of poverty. We're going to lift people. We're going to lift individuals, families, and the entire neighborhood out of poverty. And I remember there was a mom in that neighborhood who said, we are tired of you telling us that we live in poverty, that our neighborhood is impoverished. We actually have a lot of assets that people tend to look over. And, you know, we've had people come into our neighborhood and then they just they sort of, they just leave after. You know, the, the enthusiasm fades, they're gone, but we're still here. So... You know, having those six principles, like I said, before I had started some of the work I did would have been really, really helpful. 
And what I love about the principles is the sixth one, right? This commitment to act. And I think that this is, it should be maybe a commitment to act differently, right? Or to act with purpose or something like that, which really says, you know, we're not just here to engage in conversation. In fact, we're here to, you know, collectively work together to leave a, a better footprint behind us. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question, which is, I know that, you know, I know a, a bit about you. So I know that you have, um, you can only your, see the good things. <laughs> well, this is a good thing in your okay. work. When you were at, uh, at Mohawk college, um, you initiated with your partners at, uh, the Hamilton spectator, a training program for community leaders, right. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of helping them, better tell their organizational stories um, so that it fit within, you know, what the, the media might be interested in or what the community might be interested in and to, to really help them um, tell their stories in a more compelling way. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Um, I know you held a couple of cohorts of groups that went through that experience and maybe what some of the outcomes were. Yeah, so th the way it started, actually, if you haven't worked with Liz, you know that it's very hard to say no to Liz. <laughs> and so there was a poverty roundtable. Um, I think it was, a, it was a town hall. It was it was an event where we were bringing all of the community groups together. And they had done a poster display. So each each group did a poster. Liz asked if I would proofread the posters. I cannot find a typo if my life depended on it. Um, but in reviewing them, I realized you had groups that were doing similar work or one of the groups had solved the problem that the other group was just now trying to address. It was sort of the left hand and the right hand had not yet met. And there were just, there was also just a ton of great stories that in these organizations, like they were doing amazing work and they were changing and transforming people's lives. So how could we get that word out? And we realized that, you know, community groups, nonprofits, shoestring budgets. And so they don't really have the resources to go out and hire a PR agency or firm. And really, I think what limited money they have should be invested in their mission and mandate anyway. So I got together with uh, my colleague, Jane Allison, uh, who's at the Hamilton Spectator. She's since uh, started up her own consulting business, helping companies um, on corporate social responsibility. So Jane and I got together, we thought, so how can we help uh, these organizations tell better stories? Um, and we created a boot camp. It was a fun boot camp. We were gonna call it summer camp, but then we had people actually thinking it was a summer camp. So we had to go with the boot camp idea. And we'd invite, I think it was around 20 organizations at a time. So I think at the end we did around 200 different organizations came out to the camp. It was free, again, because they're all on shoestring budgets. And this was a way for Jane and I and for the Hamilton Spectator to give back to the community. And we invited them in. We said, you need to come with a pitch. And we would practice the pitch. We'd polish it up. We brought in our PR colleagues from other institutions, including Mac and uh, uh, school boards, which I think where else folks came from. But anyway, they were great. So they were our camp counselors. And the nonprofits were our, uh, our campers. And we brought down folks from the newsroom. So we brought editors and reporters down to say, you know, this is what we look for in a story. This is what would make for an even better story. And then we capped off the two days by having the nonprofits actually make pitches. And it was great because I'd say six to seven pitches would actually wind up in the spectator. And we had one uh, year where a reporter had dropped in on day one heard about one of the stories that a group was working on and it became a front page story uh, by the time we had day two of the camp. So it was really, it was a way to thank all these community groups for what they were doing. And then to say, here's how you work with the media, because if you haven't before, it can seem a bit intimidating and threatening. And really like we talked about at the start of this, finding a front door to colleges and universities. And this camp became a front door into the Hamilton spectator. So if anyone in any other communities is thinking of this kind of a partnership, it really, really works. And for the spectator, it was an opportunity to find dozens of stories. Uh, and it was an opportunity again to sort of say, you know, we live in this community. We want to tell your stories and here's how you can do a better job of uh, 
of connecting with us. So that's how the camp worked out over two days. And it was great. It was, uh, I think Jane and I got far more out of it than the campers ever did. It's interesting because it was almost like it was ahead of the curve of uh, organizational storytelling now, because you mentioned that at the very beginning yeah. of this interview, that that's a trend, right? And it almost seems like you and Jane were a little bit ahead of the curve. In terms of um, really quickly, what was maybe one or two piece of, pieces of advice that you gave to the campers, the organizations in terms of really synthesizing their stories? Yeah, I mean, it's not just uh, common to nonprofits and community groups, but there's this tendency that you want to tell everyone everything about your organization, and you just can't do that. You need to um, pick one thing that will define your organization, and it's hard. I mean, if you have a dozen programs that are going, there's that tendency that you want to talk about all 12, or you want to talk about the 10,000 people that you serve, when in fact you should just be talking about one. And so that's, I think that's the one thing we hammered over and over again to the camp is that I, I can't remember exactly what the quote is, where it's, you know, two people is a statistic, one person is a story. And it really was finding someone who can tell the story about your organization, the difference that your organization has made in their lives. You can't do it in a way that um, feels like you're sort of prostituting them. That's not quite the right word. Um, like you can't conscript anyone into it to share their story if they're not willing and they need to know exactly what they're getting into when they tell that story. But having one person building a pitch around a single person makes it so much easier for the media to pick up the story. So rather than saying we have you know a dozen programs, we serve 10,000 people, we've been in existence for 25 years, that's not something that can have a story built around it. But if you give us someone who is someone we can relate to, someone that we can cheer for, get behind, someone that we can see ourselves in or family or neighbors in. That always made for the more powerful story. And then not to, I think some prep, like do some homework with that individual, but don't leave them so rehearsed uh, that it just comes across as a PR exercise where they seem really, really polished and they just kind of sprout, spout, sorry, key messages that have obviously been crafted by a PR person. It wasn't that. We want like authentic stories and people willing to share and disclose sort of the journey they've been on and their aspirations and where they want to go. Hmm, really interesting. So my final question, yeah. and I uh, encourage others of you who are on the line to also think about questions that you might ask Jay. Um, we know that you'd, you've read over 500 books, which I think I have 500 books on my bookshelf, but I can't claim to I'm have sure read all of them. Uh, I'm a scanner more than a book reader. But yeah. what are a couple of books that are must-have books um, for community leaders? Just some of the ones that you might have reviewed recently that you think, uh, yeah, you know, if I, I, I'm, this is a compelling book. I'm interested in it. Other people might be as well. So are there some that you can share with us, Jay? So sort of go with the recency bias, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so the one I mentioned off the top, Love is Just Damn Good Business, which I'm, I'll be reviewing, I think, for next week. That's a really, really good book. And again, that's talking about as a leader, you get to decide what you love. And you either love your organization, the people you work with, and the people you serve, or you love the power, the paycheck, and the perks in your future promotion and choose wisely because we can tell what you've chosen. That's a really good book. So that's by Steve Farber. Uh, Nine Lies About Work. I really like that one. That was by Marcus Buckingham and Ashley Goodall. And it takes what we all assume to be sort of the gospel truth about leading an organization, leading people and turns it on its head. So this idea that, you know, we all want feedback. Well, the authors get into what we're actually looking for. Um, and I think one of the great quotes out of that book is that we follow people who are really good at something that matters to us. And I think, you know, the members of your Institute, um, the work that they're doing matters. And I think that in and of itself is, it will attract folks. And then the third one, um, and I might have to read this twice because I'm really guilty of it. It's called the coaching habit by Michael Stainer. 
and it's telling leaders to do more listening and less talking. And I tend to be guilty of the opposite of that. I sort of show up with advice, even if you haven't asked for it. And it's all with good intentions, but I come in and say, here's what you need to do. Here's the solution to your problem. And you may not even know that you have that problem or you even think of it as a problem. Um, but that one was really, I found, hit the mark with me. So it's the coaching habit, nine lies about work, and love is just damn good business. So, so I, I've read 500 books. I wouldn't say there's any that have transformed or changed my life, but each one has a nugget that uh, you sort of add into your arsenal. And I mean, the, I think for me, the biggest perk about being a business book reviewer for 20 years is that I have not had to have an original thought. I just sort of steal everyone else's best ideas and apply them to my own job. It's, you know, I find that um, uh, kind of helpful, right? Because even though these aren't collaborative leadership books per se, they actually do touch on this notion of collaboration, right? Yes. And, and, and or leadership. I mean, the fact that, you know, to be a leader, there's this famous TEDx video, right? that leadership is really about your first follower and then the follower mm -hmm. gathers other followers and then you become a leader. And I think, you know, if you think about um, all three books that you mentioned, there is this kind of uh, notion of reciprocity here, right? We can't be in one position without having others around us, you know, or engaging with others. And so that's the, I think that's really a compelling idea when we think about, you know, uh, collaborative leadership or community leadership is it's, it's not a singular, it's actually that time that we engage with others to really take on some things, you know, that might have, a, that might lead to a significant change in our community. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you just one quick example. So this isn't, uh, about the broader community, but it would be about the community of students. So one of the things I've noticed, the leaders who I think are the best at this, who are the most respected uh, and the best connected in any of the organizations I've worked at, they tend to do it first and then they talk about it. So you, you wanna watch it with storytelling that you're, you've actually done what you're talking about or else it's all just sort of that, you know, all hat, no cattle is how I think they describe it. So I work for a, a dean here in the Faculty of Science. She runs a research lab as well. And she has, I think, close to two dozen high school undergrad and graduate students who work in that lab. And they do uh, research studies on the community. So community members come in and, and they do exercise studies with them. So the dean volunteers to be the first test subject with each and every student. So before they work with any members of the public, the dean says, you're going to practice on me. And so she told me this and I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And then I went and saw what that practice actually involves. So they, the students will wire her up. They will put her on an exercise bike and they will push her to her limits. It's one of those endurance tests. So you and I, at the end of that bike ride would probably collapse on the floor. Um, but she just takes the mask off of her face and starts mentoring the students and says, here's what you've done really, really well. And here's what you could do perhaps differently when you work with um, people who come in from the community. So to me, that's an example of collaborative leadership where the dean is sort of putting her hand up and saying, I'm going to go first and you are going to practice on me, which I think would be really intimidating if you're a student, that you're going to wire up your dean, you're going to put electrodes all over, and then you're going to make her ride a bike to the point where she almost passes out. But um, for me, that's just one great example of leadership. So, she, you know, she doesn't need to say students are important to me. Research is important to me. She actually shows it by volunteering to be, you know, the first test subject for the students. Yeah, that's a really great story. Um, so now we're coming to the end of the conversation that you and I are going to have, Jay, and we're going to open it up to questions from our audience. Um, Again, we encourage you um, to send us your questions, if you have some, or your comments through the question box on the control panel, and we'll uh, do our best to get to uh, all of them or most of them. My colleague, Duncan, uh, has been monitoring the, the chat box, and so, Duncan, why don't you um, kick us off with the first question, and if you can tell us who asked the question, that would be helpful. 
All right, thanks, Liz. Uh, first, it's not a question, it's more of a comment, and this comes from Sandy. And they ask, although I can't think of a particular book at this moment, and that's a great point, there are lots of great things happening in the community in terms of collaborative leadership, including youth, specifically youth whose voices are not typically heard. It's a great idea um, to write about these and share them. And I think we can all agree that that's, that's been a common theme throughout this discussion. Um, our, our next question uh, comes from Jim, and it has to do with, uh, Jay, your comment about storytelling. Uh, and the comment about how the preferences for, for real stories as opposed to PR crafted stories. And those stories require vulnerability and vulnerability requires a, a measure of trust. And so um, Jim is asking, is there a type of leadership or an approach or mindset that is more likely to build or repair trust in those situations? That's a good question, Jim. Uh, um, you... I would say in your organizations, you likely have clients or members or people in the community that you're serving who've probably already put their hand up and come forward and are willing to share their story. So again, I would never ever conscript someone into it, never force them. If there's like a moment of hesitation from them, then we back off. That in the work that I've always done, if if they're not willing to share their story or they haven't shared it perhaps with family yet um, we are not going to put them forward um, and we need to prepare them that not everyone will be supportive and sympathetic um, i always tell people don't look at the comments on stories i'm not sure all media still run comment sections mm -hmm. but uh, the trolls will come out and you got to ignore them um, but by sharing your story, you're gonna help someone who's at the front end of whatever journey you've been on. And they can take inspiration from that. Um, my wife is a columnist at the Hamilton Spectator and she um, tells these stories over and over and over again. And I can assure you that whatever reporters um, that your folks are working with, they will treat them with the utmost respect and they understand, you know, what being vulnerable means to them. Like it's a huge, huge step to do that. Um, but at the same time, it's an opportunity for them to help others. Uh, we also found uh, it's sometimes an opportunity to thank the people who have helped them and to acknowledge, you know, the, the, the people in your organization who have transformed their lives. And it's, it's pretty powerful for someone to say, thank you. You have changed my life. And then also to know that you're maybe going to help someone else start that same journey. Hope that helps. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, the, the rest of the questions we have all kind of boil down to one. Um, so unless we get out any other questions in, in the next few minutes, this will probably be our last. If it's a hard but question, it goes to Liz. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. If they, lots of people are curious about why exactly no one is writing about community leadership it, through that lens. And a few people suggested that that might be because um, community leadership at its heart has a lot to do with giving up power and sharing power. Is it true that in a lot of other types of leadership books or, or business books, the idea of sharing or distributing power is, is less common? And that's one of the reasons why community leadership isn't written about as much? That's a good, Liz can weigh in on this one too. That, that's an interesting observation you know, from what I've read and from, so in the organizations where I've worked and I've worked with some really great leaders or president, CEOs, vice presidents, the ones who were the strongest, who were the most effective were far and away the most collaborative that they realized they did not have all the solutions. Sometimes all they had was a question and they knew enough to bring folks around the table and different viewpoints. There's that great quote where if everyone's thinking the same thing, then no one's thinking. Um, I found leaders who are naturally inclined to collaborate see that they don't have sort of a monopoly on the answers and they're more than willing to share. Um, sharing power is not the right word but they realize that they'll go further together and they, they are 
more than willing to collaborate. And they're not saying, no, you can't help, or we're going to involve you at the end when everything is done and decided. My experience has been sort of the best leaders, the most effective leaders, take a collaborative approach, for sure. So what do you think, Liz? Yeah, it's a really interesting question that uh, has been raised. I mean, I think at Tamarack, we've tried to write two books that my colleague Paul Bourne wrote about, you know, community conversations and deepening community, which looks at different ways to deepen that community relationship. But um, uh, it is interesting because I think I, I, I think that there is something in the experience of collaborative leadership, community leadership that is different. And it is sometimes captured in the practice of the leadership, right? The and I do think, Jay, I, I, I would not dismiss this notion of shared power. It's really mm -hmm. um, it's really thinking, you know, we all have something that is worthwhile to commit to this work. And sometimes I'll lead, sometimes I'll step behind. And so it becomes this kind of uh, not a not a dance, although a dance could be used in a, as a kind of a metaphor, but the the folks that sit around these tables i know you mentioned jim vanderveek and uh, from mohawk college right the whole notion, i would do a deep dive with jim <laughs> yeah the whole notion of you know going to community taking you know the the classroom of mohawk college and making a portable classroom in neighborhoods that takes risk right because you're uh, and it's about in some ways giving power away because you're risking the you know, the institutional boundaries that you have and say, well, if I take this into a neighborhood or into, will there be a response and will we, you know, get folks, um, you know, joining us? And I think, I think there's something about community leadership, about this collaborative leadership, which is about sharing power. It's about taking risks. And I think the point that you raised, Jay, which I agree with totally is, asking maybe some tougher questions, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you think about the beginning of the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, it was, you know, can we as a community begin to tackle this issue of poverty in our community? And is it, you know, not about folks who are poor being better off, it's about net less poor, right? And I, mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, even though, um, you mentioned um, that there's this kind of increasing Twitter war that's going on. And I, and I think that that's almost the scourge of social media. There are people having conversations about some really tough questions, right? Yeah. You know, the environment, uh, poverty, homelessness, and what can we do collectively around these issues? I don't know that we're, you know, we're, we're engaging in meaningful conversation in social media, but at least questions are being posed there and people are showing, you know, that there is a bit of a dissatisfaction with the status quo, which is, I think, the beginning of really thinking about, you know, community change and community leadership. That's just kind of some of my thoughts about, about this. No, I, I think you're right. I think people are hungry for community, sense of community. Um, one of my favorite quotes is around, like, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can do amazing things. And again, when I think of the collaborative leaders, Jim Vander, you should have Jim as a guest, if you haven't already. He'd be, <laughs> really, haven't. <laughs> he'd be really, really, really good. But the idea that, you know, if you're not in it to get the credit and the glory, you and it's not a PR exercise, but you genuinely care about the community, you can get some pretty amazing things accomplished. Yeah, you know, and I would, um, for the people that are listening, I would invite you to, you know, uh, shoot Tamarack an email and say, here's a great book that I've read on collaborative leadership or community leadership. And we'll put the list together and we'll mm -hmm. either share it as um, a post on our website or we'll do a circle back to all of you uh, maybe in a month or so to let you know the reading list that we've pulled together, not only the books that you suggested, Jay, but right. also, you know, some of the other books that uh, we might come across as well um, from our listeners and then from, um, you know, other sources that we might have come in, come across at Tamarack as well. Perfect. I'm always um, looking for something to read. 
Oh, uh, there's no end. There's, there's no, no end, end of things to read for sure. So now I'm going to just turn it back over to Jay or sorry to Duncan because I know we're what coming to the end of our time together. Wonderful. Thank you, Liz. Um, and for sure, we'll circulate. Um, actually, perhaps a, a few people in the chat were suggesting a Google Doc. Uh, we'll include that in the post webinar email. Feel free to contribute any titles or authors that you recommend, and then we can reshare that completed list with the entire group. I think that'd be a really nice example of collaborative leadership in action as well. Um, before we get started, or before we wrap up, though, we do have a few quick announcements um, about some upcoming learning opportunities. Um, and a few of them are, are, I think, incredibly relevant to the discussion uh, that we've had today. Um, the first is our workshop, Turf, Trust, and Collaboration, Practical Tools for Building Trust. Uh, we're actually having uh, one of these workshops this week, October 17th in Waterloo, Ontario, and, and another in Hamilton on December 6th. And uh, if that discussion around storytelling and trust and vulnerability really uh, resonated with you, I'd highly suggest checking this out as that next step. But it's a workshop where you'll be able to equip yourself with ideas, tools, and approaches to effectively engage diverse community partners and intentionally build trusting relationships for collaborative impact. Again, that's happening this week in Waterloo and on December 6th in Hamilton. And that's with our very own Liz Weaver. Our next learning opportunity is called Collective Impact, Leading Theory to Action. This is a two and a half day workshop taking place November 5th to 7th in Edmonton, Alberta. And it's designed to build your capacity to mobilize, launch, and sustain collective impact initiatives by providing you with theory, resources, and opportunities to practice with and learn from your peers. And this is a great opportunity uh, to dive into all of Tamrac's collective impact resources and tools. It's, it's a really great opportunity to equip yourself. Finally, we have our final learning opportunity of the fall. Uh, and this is a new event called Co-Design, Facilitating Community-Led Innovation. It's taking place November 13th and 14th in Toronto. And it's a hands-on facilitation workshop to prepare you to host and lead creative and collaborative community innovation and engagement sessions. So again, that touches on the element of sharing power and hearing new ideas and asking tough questions. Uh, this is our first time running this workshop and we're extremely excited about it. Um, so if you're interested in facilitating some community-led innovation or ideation sessions, uh, this is a great opportunity for you. Again, we're gonna be distributing a post-webinar email sometime tomorrow, and that'll include a full recording of today's call, that link to the Google Doc, so we can source those leadership books that you find helpful, as well as other links, um, for example, the McMaster Community Engagement Principles, uh, and look for that in your inbox at some point tomorrow. A huge thank you to our, our host, Liz Weaver, and you, our guest, Jay, uh, for sharing your wisdom with us and our learning community. We really appreciate what you brought to this. Thanks, Duncan. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful day.